We're in Ephesians chapter 6 still, working our way through the armor of God. We have not gotten to the pieces yet. We should get there this morning, although God sometimes interrupts between Thursday when your notes get printed that says we'll be in Ephesians 6, 13 through 15. Um, I'm not sure we'll make it through verse 15 this morning, but... um, but that's okay. We can stop at any piece. You don't have to, if, I have, if I'm not there yet to the end, we can stop a little bit early if we need to and pick that piece up next week. But let me just read verses 10 through 15 just for a little background from last week. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the might of his strength. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day And having done everything to stand firm, stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, and having put on the breastplates of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Father, I just pray this morning as we work through some of these verses that you would be glorified, that your word would go forth and accomplish everything that you send it forth to do in each of our lives. Thank you for doing your work through your word, and each of us by the power of the Holy Spirit. We're so grateful for his work on our behalf. What an amazing God we have. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As fallen sinful humans, we are naturally very selfish beings. We're very self-centered. As natural people, we just think the world revolves around us, don't we? Look Look at an infant. Not picking on our, our first-time visitor this week uh, who's a newborn in the Browski family, but uh, her first time at church is going to hear the truth, right? Um, but think about an infant and how they cry and cry when they don't get what they want because the world revolves around them. You know, that's natural, and, and actually I'm glad they cry. It helps us know they have a need. But we grow up and we don't really change, do we? We still believe the world revolves around us And we live for ourselves and we live for what I want naturally. This was Eve's motivation when she took the fruit. Remember, we talked about this last week. As Satan tempts her to take the fruit, he tempts her to believe that God was leaving her in the dark. You're missing out. Uh, God isn't isn't being honest with you and transparent with you. He's hiding some things from you. And you can be so much more if you would just take the fruit. And of course, we know that she does. Eve wanted her agenda, not God's agenda. Adam wasn't so much deceived as he just was rebellious. And he participated in the same deed. And now we all have fallen into that sin nature of wanting our own way naturally. However, when we come into Christ, we become a new creation. Old things pass away. All things become brand new. Do they not? We are new creations. And now we recognize that we live for God's glory, that we don't exist for ourselves Rather, we exist for God and for God's purposes, not our own purposes. Romans chapter 11, verses 33 through 36, if you would like to turn there. I believe that the Christian would agree with Paul in this text. We would wholeheartedly, as new creations in Christ, completely agree with Paul here. And what he has to say in these verses in Romans chapter 11, verses 33 through 36, we would say this, Oh, the depth of the riches 
and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who became his counselor? Or who has first given to him that it might be repaid to him? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. This is the Christian mantra, the Christian statement that we exist now for his glory, for his purposes. It's no longer about our agenda anymore. It's about his agenda. Over in 1 Peter chapter 1, we hear a little bit about God's agenda. We begin to recognize that it is so much greater than us. It's more involved than just us, what God does. And we see that in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 12. It's revealed to us a little bit. Here he's talking about the Old Testament prophets and their writings. And he says here in 1 Peter 1.12, it was revealed to them, these Old Testament prophets, that they were not serving themselves, but you. They weren't serving themselves, they were serving the church. In these things, which now have been declared to you, through those who proclaim the gospel to you, by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. These things revealed to us through the Old Testament prophets, by the Old or by the Holy Spirit, through those prophets, declared to us through the gospel, by the Spirit. And then he says, things into which angels long to look. Angels, they watch the church get saved. They watch God sanctify the church. And they're amazed. And they, they observe this. Ephesians actually speaks to that. Paul wrote about that in Ephesians chapter 3. Getting a little close to our context here in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 8 through 10. Paul, in speaking of the gospel, says this, To me, the very least of all saints, this grace was given to proclaim to the Gentiles the good news or the gospel of the unfathomable riches of Christ and to bring to light for all what is the administration of the mystery which for ages has been hidden in God who created all things. What is this mystery? So that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church the mystery is that there's the church and the manifold wisdom of God is made known to who through the church? What's he say? Look with me. I lost my place. I gotta find it again, I'm sorry. So that the, I'm sorry, verse 10. So that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. See the spiritual realm there? And, and, and when we were there, we were talking about the elect angels as I worked through that text. But I don't think we should exclude that God is also making known his manifold wisdom to the fallen angels, to all the spiritual realm of his wisdom. This is an amazing truth that God saves us not just for us. Do we benefit from our salvation? Oh, greatly, tremendously we benefit. But it's not just for our benefit. It's for the benefit, obviously, of the glory of God, the glory of God's manifold wisdom to be displayed to the spiritual realm. There's so much going on that we don't see that we don't day to day recognize the spiritual realm that is around us, that is watching the church, 
watching God transform the church, and they're amazed. They're amazed at God's wisdom. And that is the context in which Paul is writing here in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 15. I'm just going to review quickly the first few verses. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the might of his strength. Our hope is in the Lord. We don't look to men. We don't look to the powers of this earth. We, we don't look to our friends to bail us out. We look to our Lord. We look to Jesus Christ. Psalm 121 says this. I will lift up my eyes to the mountains. From where shall my help come? My help comes from Yahweh, who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to stumble. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will not slumber and will not sleep. If our help comes from the Lord, we never say, help, and he's snoring. He's not paying attention. He's dozed off. That does not happen with our God. When our strength is found in the Lord, it is ever-present. It is ever-available to us. You know, you, you might find yourself in trouble one day and call a friend or phone a friend like they did on the uh, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire show, and they might not answer they, they might not get back to you. They might not be available. You might get the voicemail. But when you call to the Lord, he answers. He is your help. We need to find our strength in the Lord, verse 11, and put on the full armor of God so that we will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Understanding that the devil is scheming. He's a deceiver. That's what we talked about last week. He is always trying to deceive us. Proverbs 14, 12 says, There is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. And Satan is always trying to convince us that there's another way, a little different way than God's way. And convince us, doesn't that seem right to you? And that's how we fall for it. Because it seems right. Because he's deceived us. So we need to be armored up. We need to be prepared for the battle, to battle against these schemes. Because in verse 12, he says, our struggle isn't against flesh and blood, but it's against rulers, authorities, world forces of this darkness, spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. The battle is spiritual. I think far too often we fall into the trap of thinking that the battle is here in the physical realm. And it's not. Bringing carnal weapons to spiritual war is like bringing a BB gun to take down a grizzly bear. And maybe none of you have heard stories of hunting grizzly bear, but I have. I had a man who was a customer of mine who hunted grizzlies, and he said, when you're out hunting a grizzly, you don't sh if they're coming towards you, you do not shoot them in the top of the head because you just make them angry. Because it won't penetrate. Their, their skull is so thick. You've got to find the soft flesh if you're going to kill, take down a grizzly. But you're not going to do it with a BB gun. A BB gun's not going to harm that grizzly. And that's what it would be to bring carnal weapons to a spiritual battle. They are ineffective. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 6, here's what Paul says. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the tearing down of strongholds as we tear down speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ and are ready to punish all disobedience whenever your obedience is fulfilled. Our weapons are spiritual and they are more powerful. When we neglect the armor of God, we neglect the real power available to the Christian. When we start waging war with carnal weapons, with just words and, and, and just actions and, and thinking we can just work it up within ourselves and not relying on the strength God has provided for us, we are so weak. We don't have the strength. We need the armor of God. 
And that is Paul's plea. In fact, he says in verse 13, therefore, take up the full armor of God. This is the third command he's issued in these four verses. The first one is be strong in the Lord. The second one is put on the full armor of God. And then the third one is take up the full armor of God. What's the difference between putting on and taking up? Well, putting on is getting dressed. And I'm thankful to say I wasn't sure if this analogy would work, but it did. You all dressed this morning. I'm thankful for that. And I'm sure each of you are thankful too. We probably all had dreams where maybe we forgot to dress. We end up, I remember as a kid having those dreams and I was in school and embarrassed as all get out because I didn't dress that morning. Thankfully, we all did. But I'm also thankful that you are continuing to take up what you're wearing this morning because to take up means to carry it around, to keep it on, to not take it off. Some people say you, pray, you should pray on the armor of God every morning, and that's not bad advice, but I would say, why'd you take it off last night? <laughs> you gotta sleep with the armor on. You've gotta carry it around all of the time. This is so important, and we'll see why as we work through the rest of this verse, verse 13. He says, so that you will be able to resist in the evil day. When's the evil day? He says, you need to be able to resist in the evil day. Well, when is that? Is that an important question? When is the evil day? Turn back just to Ephesians chapter 5. He's already told us. Ephesians 5, verses 15 and 16. He's already told us when the day is evil. He says, therefore, look carefully how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, redeeming the time because why? The days are evil. The days are evil now. Now is the evil day. We need to understand, Christians, and I think we forget this in our comfort, especially here in the U.S., which aren't we comfortable? I am. I'm very comfortable. God has supplied so much in this nation and freedom. Has he not? And it's by his grace and goodness that he has done that, and I'm thankful for it. But sometimes in that comfort, I think I forget we live in an evil day. I sit around with people, uh, men especially in our Bible study, we have this conversation Saturday, and just, we can't believe what's going on. And I'm like, the reason we can't believe is because we don't believe the Bible. If we would just believe we live in the evil day, we'd say, yeah, we should expect this. We should expect what we see going on in our culture and in our world. The whole world lies in the power of the evil one. God has told us this is the case. We live behind enemy lines. We're in his territory. Now understand, and I'll say this again, God is always sovereign. Satan can go no further than God allows. We see that pictured clearly in the book of Job. But make no mistake that God has given him a lot of freedom even to attack his church. And in his grace and mercy, and believe it, it is his grace and mercy, God often says, go ahead, Satan. Attack that church. Attack that individual. Go ahead. Watch them stand firm. Watch the manifold wisdom of myself, God says, that has worked in this person's life and in this church's life. Go ahead and do so. It's under God's sovereign hand, yes, but that does not negate the fact that we live behind enemy lines. Also, I want to point out that this is to the church. We often individualize so much of Scripture. And so we think about the armor of God, and we think individually put on the armor of God, but we ought to think as a church, we need to put on the armor of God. Because the attacks come primarily against the church. Now, he will use an individual in the church to attack the church. But he doesn't just want to take down one of us. He wants to take down the whole thing. And we live in his territory. He is the ruler and power of this age. We need to be prepared, don't we? In fact, we need to be prepared because we need to be able to resist. He says that so that you will be able to resist in the evil day. James chapter 4, verse 7. Because I think so often times, and you'd go ahead and turn there, and I'll read it in a second. So often times we, we make up different ways to fight Satan. 
We, we make up our own ways. I, I hear this sometimes, you know, um, some of the charismatics may start to re- I rebuke Satan. Uh, the Bible says Michael wouldn't even rebuke, but he said the Lord rebuke you. You know, I just, I, I saw something, I think it was from a Puritan, which I love the Puritans, but it, it was like, mock Satan, because he can't stand to be mocked. Let's see if that's what the Bible says. Because so far, Paul said resist. James 4, verse 7, be subject therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Well, James and Paul both say to resist. We'll turn over to 1 Peter. Let's see if Peter has any other thoughts on the matter. How should we respond to the evil one when he attacks? 1 Peter chapter 5, look with me at verses 8 and 9. Be of sober spirit. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. But resist him, firm in the faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished among your brethren who are in the world. I think if Peter and James and Paul all said, our job is to resist Satan, then I think what we ought to do is resist Satan. I don't think we should try to come up with other strategies. I think if three different men, apostles of Jesus Christ, commanded us to resist, I think we need to figure out what it means to resist. And by the way, in Peter, we see that some of these attacks that come against Satan are suffering. Suffering. Some attacks are suffering. In fact, in this particular case, it's persecution. Peter resisted to the point of death, didn't he? Tradition says he was hung upside down because he said, I don't want to be hung up, I don't want to be crucified like my Lord, so he was crucified upside down. Paul resisted to the point of death. James likely resisted to the point of death. Persecution. And what does it mean to resist? Right? What does that mean that's important to understand? Turn over to Matthew chapter 4, because if someone showed us how to deal with Satan, the perfect example, wouldn't it be Jesus? Wouldn't Jesus be our perfect example of how to react when Satan attacks us and schemes against us? In Matthew chapter 4, I'm not going to go deep into this text just because We're going to Matthew after we're done with Ephesians, and I'll probably be in this text, well, I don't know when, but it'll probably be next year, Lord willing, and uh, and I don't want to steal the thunder that I might have on that particular Sunday, but let's just look at it quickly, if, if we can. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Just note that. Who led Jesus into the wilderness? The Holy Spirit led him in there, Right? for the purpose to be tempted by the devil. Jesus was tempted by the devil for our benefit. This is for our benefit. He was tempted in every way like we are yet without sin. Have you ever thought what that means? I forget who was the first person that kind of brought this to my attention. It wasn't, this isn't my own thinking. Somebody else brought it to me. I thought, man, I think that's brilliant. Because Jesus was tempted in the same way in every way that we were tempted except without sin which means he faced the most temptation anyone could ever face. And here's why. Because sin, if you think about pressure, as I bring my hands together, there's more pressure. This is, this is temptation. It's coming closer and closer and closer and bringing more pressure where eventually I'm going to give. Well, we sin. We give in to temptation, right? At some point, that pressure builds so much, it, it causes us to sin. And Jesus never sinned. So the pressure continues, and the pressure continues, and the pressure continues, and he's steadfast and immovable, and he never sins. And he deals with maximum temptation without sin. The fact that he did it without sin means he was tempted far beyond any one of us ever experienced. And so if he is the example of that, then what what does Matthew have to teach us here? Verse 2, and after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry that seems like an obvious statement to me. I mean, if I fast 40 minutes and 
you know, 40 seconds. I'm hungry. <laughs> and he, you know, I mean, I, I'm sure he got hungry before them, but Matthew just wants to make sure we don't miss the point. He's hungry. Verse 3, and the tempter came and said to him, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. Why is that a temptation? I mean, we understand why he'd be tempted to make the stones bread, but why is that a temptation of sin? I mean, is it a sin to make bread? Boy, I hope not. Because I like bread, and I hate to cause my wife to sin. <laughs> no, it's not a sin to make bread, but what, what's going on here? Well, you, you kind of have to see a couple of things. First, what does Satan say? If you are the Son of God. Did Satan know that Jesus was the Son of God? Yeah. Absolutely, he did. And you go to Mark and you see Jesus casting out demons because the demons are saying, we know you're the Son of God. And he's like, quiet, get out of him. Because he's saying, my, my ministry, I'm not ready to be revealed of all of who I am yet. I'm keeping that on the down low for now. And so he's constantly pushing these demons out of people who are trying to say, we know who you are. They knew. If the, if the minions under Satan knew, then Satan himself knew. This is the son of God. But he's causing doubt in Jesus' mind. Jesus, truly God, truly man. And he's trying to cause doubt in the truly man of God truly son of man, Jesus. And so he says, then command these stones to become bread. And what does Jesus say? It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Who led Jesus into the wilderness? The Spirit did. Who led Jesus into, into fasting for 40 days and 40 nights? The Spirit did. And if Jesus would have said, I'm going to ignore what the Spirit calls me to do, and I do what Satan calls me to do so that I can prove that I am who I say I am. That's sin because I veered off the course that God has laid before me. But I'm going to be steadfast and immovable. And I'm going to quote scripture back to him and basically say, no, <laughs> I'm going to stand firm. I'm, he resists the devil. Verse 5, then the devil took him into the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, if, again, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and on their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. Oh, the attack on God's word. The deception of the word of God. Just twist it a little bit. Is it true that God would protect Jesus, his son, while he was here on earth, absolutely is true. But Jesus responds, he says, again it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. I'm not to act like an idiot. <laughs> Outside of the will of God, God did not call me to cast myself off the temple. I'm not to act like that just to prove that God approves of me. No. I will not do that. And Jesus, again, quotes scripture in the right context back to Satan. And he does not fall for the deception. He stands firm. He resists. And then verse 8, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. He's the ruler of this world. He has dominion. It's a legitimate offer. Bow down to me and you can have it. This whole cross thing, Jesus, that your father wants you to face, you don't have to go to the cross. I'll put all things under your feet. Because he's given me dominion. Take the shortcut. Take the easy way. Just get on your knees. Prostrate yourself. Give me a little worship. Now, don't give me much. I'm not asking for a lifetime here. I'm just asking for a little. It's all yours. And Jesus says to Satan, go, Satan. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And Jesus would not veer from the plan of God for him. He came to do the will of his father. 
And that was his single, singular mission here on earth, was to do all that God called him to do. And he resisted. And he stood firm. He abounded in the work of the Lord. Just as we are supposed to. Our singular mission is to fulfill the will of God. Is to do the will of God. Is to give God glory. And what we do in resisting is we just continue on the path that God has laid before us. And we don't waver. This word resist it actually has within it the same word that's translated stand firm. It just, you could add the word against. Stand firm against. In the Greek, it's, it's an anti of the word that says stand firm. So it means stand firm against. Be opposed. And, and it's not to go into battle and fight or to seek out a fight. It's just like a soldier. Stand firm. Stay in place. Keep doing what you're supposed to do. He says at the end of verse 13, and having done everything to stand firm. God has supplied everything we need to stand firm. He has supplied it all. You lack nothing to stand firm. You know, our government supplies their soldiers with what they need to go to war. A good government does that. They don't send their soldiers into battle without the equipment that they need. How much better is our God who equips his people, who gives them everything they need? But according to this text we still must put it on. He supplied it, but we still have to put it on. We still have to wear it. It'd be as though a soldier left all his equipment back in the camp and went out into battle forgetting it was supplied to him. We would say, how foolish. <laughs> how foolish could you be? You've been given everything you need to be protected and you come out unprotected? God has supplied it all. I had um, 2 Peter 1 read to us in our scripture reading this morning. Steve read that for us. And I'm not going to reread it. But I just want to point you to 2 and 3 of 2 Peter chapter 1. Where he greets the exiles, the Jewish people. He says, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the full knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Through the full knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence, the grace of God supplies us all that we need. I think oftentimes we think about salvation and God supplying us salvation. That's good. But he's not done when he just supplies us salvation. He supplies us all that we need to live a sanctified life. And these are graces of God. As we go through the armor of God, we must understand that these are graces of God. These are gifts of God to us. I think sometimes we can be Maybe like a soldier, you know, Jeff was in, in Iraq, and, and I'm sure it was hot there. In fact, I think it's it cold here pretty easily because you got too used to the hot over there. And I imagine, and correct me if I'm wrong, but there were days you put on the equipment and it was a little hot to wear all that you had to wear. Yeah. And it felt burdensome. And, and it made you weary because it's too hot and it's too warm, but when you're in enemy territory, you don't take it off. It may feel burdensome sometimes to wear the armor, but if we can understand the seriousness of the battle, if we can understand that we live behind enemy lines, if we can understand the necessity of being armored up, wouldn't we wear it? Wouldn't we wear it? We'd be foolish to take it off. We'd be crazy 
to take it off, if we knew where we were. And so take up the full armor of God, wear it. And verse 14 but opens up with the, with the fourth command. Stand firm, therefore. This is the fourth command in five verses. And I think that's intentional. Because when you are a soldier, you are under orders. You're given commands. And I think Paul is firing out commands like he's a commander over an army. And there's a sense in which he is. The army of the Lord, the church, and he's commanding and commanding and commanding. And I think there's just an analogy that he's drawing out here. And it's as though he's yelling, stand firm, hold fast, persevere, endure. Don't you hear those words elsewhere in scripture? To hold fast, to endure, to persevere, to stand firm. Hang in there. You hear that all throughout scripture. That's the role of Christian. Steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Stand firm, therefore, and then he gives the first thing to put on. Having girded your loins with truth. What does that mean? Have you girded your loins this morning? (laughs) If somebody asks me that, I say, what are you talking about? To gird your loins, basically you have to kind of take yourself back in history, and they would wear these tunics, and, and, and the tunic basically was like a dress, and these soldiers would wear that, and it would probably come down to about their knees or so, two holes, one for each arm, a hole for the head, and basically just be a simple little dress that they would wear. It wasn't feminine at all, this is just what these men wore in those times, now, I thought about an analogy modern day, like what could help you think through this because, because we don't wear these things, men at least don't. <laughs> and, and why would that be a problem? Well, if you think about around your knees having something that restricts your movement, and if you were to try to lift your leg, you might only have so much movement because the tunics grab it onto the back of your leg and you cannot move so well. And I thought of an analogy, I thought about a trend that's been around for well over 20 years, of young men, and they still do it today. I don't know when the trend's ever going to go away, but young men that wear their pants, see they give out these baggy pants that are about six sizes too big, and they wear them down about here, you know, and the crotch is down here, and when they walk, they kind of walk like this because they can't take <laughs> big steps, you know. <laughs> And, and if one of those young men were ever in a building where a fire occurred and they had to run, they're going to fall down. You know, they cannot move. They don't have any movement. Their movement's restricted. In fact, if you've ever seen a video of someone running with that clothing on, they, they hike up their pants so they can run because they have no freedom of movement. And it's kind of a similar idea. A soldier would hike up his tunic, and whether he'd tie it to itself or whether he'd have a sash or a belt, I don't know exactly, but I know he would tie it up tightly to himself. Now he's got freedom of movement. There's nothing restricting his movement. And he could be his own worst enemy if he didn't gird his loins. He could fall over just like that and be so vulnerable. No matter how much armor he has, he's laying on the ground now, he's vulnerable as a soldier. Well, we're supposed to stand firm with our loins girded with truth. With truth. Pilate asked Jesus, what is truth? What is truth? It seems pretty simple, and it seems very complex in the culture we live in, doesn't it? I don't know if there's anything that makes it more obvious that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one than the lack of truth in our culture today. Your truth and my truth and and what's true for me may not be true for you. And then there's absolute truth where there is no absolute truth. You know, I mean, I can be what I want to be and if you disagree with me, then you're a bigot, you're a homophobe, you're this, you're that. There's no truth. I I would argue that these people do believe in absolute truth, though, and if you want to know if they believe in absolute truth, steal their wallet. You'll find out very quickly, that's mine. Well, that's your truth. (laughs) My truth is it belongs to me. (laughs) 
You'll find out they do believe in absolute truth. What they don't believe in is any truth that's uncomfortable for them. They're denying the truth. But it's not because they don't believe. They know it's the truth. They're denying it because they don't like it, because they hate it. Romans 1 would really kind of teach us that. And truth is and always has been under assault. Right back to where Satan in the garden. Truth is and always has been under assault. We don't live in anything new today. The writer of Ecclesiastes, Solomon said, nothing new under the sun. It's always been this way. I know we think we live in special times. It's always been this way. Maybe more extreme at some times than the others. But it's not just, I think immediately I think truth, and of course, I, I think this, don't you? And, and this is truth. And this is encompassed in the words that Paul is using, but it's not his primary driver, and we know that because later on he's going to say, take up the sword of the Spirit which is what? The Word of God. And so he's saving that for later, even though it would be encompassed under truth. Because truth really means what accords with reality. What accords with reality? What is real? And by the way, there is always truth. There's always truth. You may not know it. You may not see it clearly from your perspective, but there is truth to be found. And I don't believe Paul is specifically just yet calling us to, to, to this truth, although he is in a sense, and I'll get there in a moment. But I think, first of all, Ephesians 4.25 indicates what, what Paul is calling us to. Ephesians 4.25, where he speaks of truth earlier, in the same letter, he says, therefore, have laying aside falsehood, speak truth to each one of you with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. I think first and foremost, he's saying you need to express truth to one another. You need to be honest with one another. You need to be truthful. No falsehood. No falsehood. And I believe that goes further than just our expressions, although it does include our expressions to one another. But it also, I believe, includes being on the outside what you are on the inside. Integrity. Integrity. You are not truthful if you're not a person of integrity. If you're a, a person who's one thing on the outside and something different on the inside, you're not truthful. You're being dishonest. For some of us, that means we need more change on the inside, doesn't it? Because if I was too open with what was on the inside, sometimes I'd run people over. And so i got to get changed more on the inside. But the reality is, is that we are to be people of integrity, people who are not two-faced. We're honest, we're open with one another. But I believe it goes even further than that, that we're to seek truth in every circumstance as well. I've talked before, and I'll do it again this morning just briefly, on biblical counseling. Um, I love biblical counseling when it's done rightly. But I've seen it done poorly. And sometimes it's done poorly, and here's why. Because we aren't humble, we aren't patient with people to come to the truth. I've met biblical counselors who their, their main goal was to fix the person in front of them. <laughs> that sounds reasonable. Somebody comes in your office for help. I want to fix the person in front of me. But they never took the time to get to know the person in front of them, to get to know the situation that's going on. The heart is a deep well, but a man of discernment finds it out means it takes time to dig into this well and find out what's going on. They become like a physician who were to walk into the room and, and you say, my leg's a little sore. Well, we're going to cast it up. Were you going to do an x-ray to see if it's... No, we're just going to put it... I had a sore leg once too and I'm, I was broken, so I'm going to cast it up. Well, what if it's a sprain or what if my leg's sore because it just fell asleep? Well, we're going to put cast on for six weeks. We'll check it later and see if that heals it up. You know, and you're going to have your leg atrophying because you're not using it for six weeks. This is foolishness. What do they do? They test, right? They find out what's going on. They find out the truth. Is your leg really broken because it does no, no good to cast a leg that's not broken? It doesn't heal it. You got something else going on. What if you got an infection? It's going to make it worse. We've got to deal in truth with one another. Proverbs 23, 23 says, buy truth and do not sell it. Get wisdom and discipline and understanding. We're people of truth. 
We can't apply the word of God rightly if we do not apply it to circumstances in a truthful way. If we do not know the truth of the circumstances, we end up applying, applying truth to the wrong thing. Is it true that a cast will fix, will help stabilize and heal a bone if it's set properly? That's true. But if you have an infection, that true cast will not do anything for that infection. You have to apply it rightly, do you not? Similarly, we have to apply the word of God rightfully. And that means we have to do what it says in Ephesians chapter 2. I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter 4. Verses 1 through 3. Therefore I, the prisoner in the Lord, exhort you to walk worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another, being diligent to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Let me tell you from my own experience, it takes patience. It takes a lot of humility. It takes a lot of gentleness, and it takes a lot of bearing with one another, sometimes, to find the truth. It's not always so obvious. It takes time. And as the church... We do that with one another. We love each other because we are worth taking the time. You are worth taking the time to find out the truth of the matter so I can truly help you if you come to me for counseling. You are worth that. And it may mean that I don't get you out of my office and get you fixed as soon as I'd like to. That's okay. That's where patience comes in. That's where humility comes in, where I say, I don't have all the answers. But I'll learn. And I'll grow with you, and I'll come alongside of you, and I'll help you. And as God continues to bring us people, people have mess and struggle in their lives. And we need to be people of truth who are willing to dive in deep into that well and find out the truth of what's going on and then apply the word of God rightly to their lives and help them. We need to hold on to truth. And we need to hold on to truth because Satan's primary tool is deception. His primary tool is deception. And, and, and he, just as he with Jesus tried to misapply the word of God, he will try to cause that in you too. To misapply it to someone. So that it brings hurt and division and trouble and a lack of unity and a lack of peace within the church. We must be, like Solomon said, People who buy truth and don't sell it. I will buy the truth and I will not give it up. That's how we need to be. And he says, get wisdom and discipline and understanding. Truth cannot be gained without those, without wisdom, without discipline, and without understanding. We'll never find truth without it. And so truth is our first defense. It's our undergarment, so to speak, and I think that's as far as we're going to get this morning is getting our undergarments on, and maybe that's enough for us to go work on, to tighten up truth around us, to consider with the relationships that I have, am I being truthful, am I dwelling in truth with them? But I want to leave you again with what I said earlier. Do not neglect the armor of God. Don't neglect it. it. Can I tell you when it comes to truth, it can, like, like I said, it can be burdensome. It can be tiresome. You know, this is the 10th person time I've had this person in my office and we're still struggling to find out what's going on yet. So what? Buy the truth, don't sell it. It's tiresome, but it's worth it. This is a protection for the church, for us to dwell in truth. Every one of these pieces of armor are protection for our church. Are we not worth it? Are, are the people here together with you, are they not worth it? But Satan is going to come in, and he is preparing his next attack. Perhaps it's on truth. So let's gird it up. Let's put it on. Let's tighten it up. Let's make sure we dwell in it. And maybe it's on one of the other pieces of armor. I don't know. Let me tell you this. The reason we're called to put the full armor of God on is because Satan's going to find whichever vulnerability we leave off. 
He's looking for that vulnerability in the armor. Just as in a battle, the enemy will always look for the most vulnerable spot to penetrate the line. Satan's doing the same thing. So be prepared. I just, I just can't stress the urgency of these things enough. As God does things and works and grows and, and grows us in knowledge of him, let's not neglect the basics. This is really basic, isn't it? The basics of the word of God. Can I tell you this? It's not complex. <laughs> the Christian life is really not all that complex. It's hard to do, isn't it? <laughs> it's hard to live out, but it's not complex. We can all understand it by the Spirit of God and with his help, can't we? Let's ask him for that even now. Father, thank you for your Holy Spirit who helps us, who moves and works and takes his word and implants it in our hearts and changes us. And, and without him, without you, without Christ, we can do nothing of any profit whatsoever. But in you and in Christ and in the Spirit, you do amazing things through us. And it's beyond our comprehension, the fact that <laughs> the, fact that the spiritual realm pays attention and, and watches the church, that you would use failed beings such as us to manifold your wisdom to such great beings in the spiritual realm, but we know it's true. And Father, we don't want to fail. So give us strength. Let us hope in you even this week as we, as we will go in a moment. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.